Okay. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Is there feedback? Okay. So today we'll be discussing intermediate topics. If any, I'll be covering the posting periods, the activity ledger and projects. And then Amanda will cover topics including account structure, reports, modules and configurations, as well as pending transactions. If anyone has questions, please feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself to speak up and we'll answer your questions. So I'm going to start on the wiki page and show you where you can find this recording link to view later, as well as other meetings and trainings that are upcoming. So this is where you registered for today. So if you go down to October 16th, it'll be right here when the meeting is done or later today. You can also find the training materials for today under the redesign section, intermediate training, the agenda and the PowerPoint presentation is linked right there. So you can access that. So I'm gonna get started talking about posting periods and their status. A posting period is a period in a fiscal year where transactions can be created or updated. You have to have an open period to post transactions, but first you must create a posting period for the month to exist or for you to have um, the ability to enter transactions in that month. So to do that, you'll want to go to core, posting periods, Click on create. I'm gonna create the posting period of January. So it's the calendar year 2021. I could choose to make it current. I am not going to, I'm just gonna create it. And when you create a posting period, it is automatically set to open. And you can view that on the grid here where it's true under the open column. You can close a period or reopen it by clicking on these folders. This one's to close September and this one would be to reopen July. And if you notice the hovering tips will help you. So like I said, a posting period must be open to post transactions to a month or a period, but the posting period does not necessarily have to be current. A current period can actually be open or closed. So since this is kind of confusing, I'm gonna give you another way to look at it as well as share some examples. Many of you are younger, but back in the old days, accounting was manual and done on paper with a pencil. You had to actually go to get the physical book for the month, open the book before you wrote any entries in that book for that period. So the concept with the redesign is the same. The physical book in the old days is now the redesign posting period in this example. So before you make any entries or transactions, you must open the book or in the redesign, you must open your posting period before you can do that. But it doesn't have to be the current month to enter a transaction. You just have to open the book and make the entry. Open the period and make the entry. So basically the current period will give you the current month to date and fiscal year to date totals on your reports, which will also be on the accounts. But an open period will allow you to create and modify transactions. And as you can see here, you can have several periods open. You can even have the whole fiscal year, every month of the fiscal year open if you choose. However, you can have only one current period. Right now, this instance is set to be the current period of September. And you can see that by the green highlighted bar, as well as up in the right-hand corner where it says September, 2020. 
So if I wanted to make October current, if I hover over the check mark, you'll see that if I click it, it is now the current month. You can also delete a period if and only if there are no transactions attached to the period. And you would click on that icon if that's the case. So since a current posting period will give you the reports with the month to date and fiscal year to date totals from the accounts, if you need a report and the period is closed, such as July, to get this report to reflect the totals as if we were back in July, you would simply make that period current by clicking the icon. Temporarily, you'll, you'll make it current temporarily. You'll run your report and then you'll go back to your current month. So I'm gonna give you an example. The auditor wants a report as of June 2020. And that way you can just set the period and make it current, whether it's open or not. And the re report will have the results with the June totals. So by just making it current, it's also a safeguard because remember, you have to have an open period to post a transaction. So if while you're running that June report, you really don't want the period to be open for other users in the district to be posting transactions. So it's kind of like a safeguard because the user, if they tried to enter a transaction would get an error that the posting period is closed. So we're gonna look at an example in the system, but I am going to use the month of July in my example rather than June. So I want to get totals for July and the current period is indicated by September. The scenario is the school board wants a copy of July's budget summary and you can't find the hard copy and let's just say someone deleted the reports in the archive. So you want to run this report as of July, as if it was July. So we're not editing any transactions, so we can just make July current. So now it's indicated as the current posting period. And I'm gonna run a budget summary on a specific account <clears throat> I'm going to do the 006 fund. We don't need that date because, again, we're running it as of um, July. So let's generate this report. And this report will reflect the reporting period up in the upper left corner, July 2020. And the current month to date expended will be the July total. And in this case, since it's July, it's the fiscal year to date total as well. So if I was to go to the account, that expenditure account, you will also see that in July, it's the account is going to be reflecting the July totals. With 1,445 in fiscal year date and month to date. So let's change the current posting period back to some September and see the effects. And I can do that by just making September current because all I want to do is run a report. It's indicated as a current period.
or run the same account. And now the posting period or the reporting period is September and there was nothing expended in the month, but the fiscal year to date is reflecting everything from July to September. And again, if we go to the account, you will also see that the account, because this report is pulling from the account, the account is gonna reflect the same thing. So month to date is zero, and fiscal year to date is 1,445. So that's an example of running a report by changing the period to a current period. And as I said earlier, an open period will allow you to create or modify transactions. So that means that you can edit a purchase order and this option becomes available in an open period. You can change an invoice status from partial to full or vice versa. An invoice date can be changed only in an open period. And under disbursements, voids can be created in an open period. You can reverse a receipt in an open period. And you can also enter future year requisitions as long as the period is open. So some real life examples of why one would reopen a period. Again, to make a transaction, you must open the books. So let's say the month is closed and the treasurer discovers not all the transactions were posted. They can simply open the month, make that transaction, close the month, and you're good to go. Um, if you want to change an account or a description on a receipt or another transaction, like a purchase order or requisition, you can do so in a open period. Another example is the district has invoices entered, the month closed before the payments were processed. But in the meantime, the district found an error and wants to correct it before the checks are processed. So, so they would just simply reopen the posting period, correct that and go to the, the next month. And one more example, if the fiscal year is closed, but EMIS errors are discovered regarding the transactions and transactions posted to the wrong account, again, you can reopen that posting period, correct those entries and close the period. So we have talked about making the posting period open as well as current. But there are other options in regards to running some reports without changing the period to current. And now with report options, you really only need to, you really only have to change the current period when running any outstanding reports. These would be like the outstanding purchase order report, the outstanding disbursement report, um, those type of outstanding reports are, are really the only ones that you really have to change now. And this is because on transaction-based reports, you can now enter the dates. And these dates, and I'll show you this in a minute, these dates entered would filter the data based on the start and stop dates. And on account-based reports, you can now use the report parameter of total as of to run the report based on the period of time, again, without making the, the period current. So I'm going to run a transaction-based report such as the SSDT requisition summary report. And I'm gonna enter the transaction starts, start and stop dates that I want the report to reflect. 
So on, again, the transaction-based report, you can enter these dates. And I just want to note, it is a current period of September when I'm running this. But I can, again, pull these dates in and the, transa the transactions will be pulled in. You will note the, the information on the posting period is indicated in the upper left with the start and stop dates. And you'll notice the September requisitions an August requisition, as well as all your July requisitions. And we got this without changing the current posting period. And on the account-based reports, like the budget summary or appropriation summary or the revenue summary reports, you can use the total as of period to get the data without making the posting period current. So let's look at the same budget summary on the same account that we ran earlier, but remember we changed the current period to July earlier. So we're not changing it, we're leaving it as September. We'll go into that report. My account numbers, but down here, total as of period, oops, is what I'm talking about. <clears throat> when we enter a July date into that report option, it will pull the data based on that period. Now, with account based in this parameter, this will not limit the transactions pulled into this report. So whether you enter it as July 15th or July 1 or July 30th, you're gonna get the report totals that show month to date, fiscal year to date totals as of July. So I'm going to generate that report. The reporting period is July, as of period July. The month to date, remember, was 1,445, and it matched the fiscal year to date. So just by using that report option and leaving the current period as is, you can run a report on account-based reports. <clears throat> there are always exceptions to the rule, and these would be the outstanding reports where you have to set the posting periods that you want data for, for that current period. So for example, that outstanding purchase order report Normally, as I demonstrated, you would run a transaction-based report, and POs are transactions. You would normally run a transaction-based report and just enter the dates that I just showed you, like 7-1 through 9-30. However, I'm going to show you the reason, which is due to the filter in the, in the report, of why you have to change the posting period to that period so that your data reflects that period. So today is October 16th and the auditor wants an open PO summary report as of the end of fiscal year 20 to match the detail report that is saved under the file archive. And he wants this because the report is 300 pages under the file archive. So in my demo site, I do not have June data or last year's data in it. But I just really wanted to explain why change in this current period works with the outstanding reports. And I can do that without running the report. 
So I'm going to pull up this outstanding purchase order report. And you notice that the current posting period is September. And remember that account-based reports have that report option to use at total as of, but since a purchase order is a transaction, you're not gonna see that option here. So the filter that is limiting you to change that current period to June or July in my example, these, to get, let me start over. So the filter that is limiting you to change the period to a current period to get the totals for June for the auditor would be this filter right here. Oops. And you, it moves, sorry. But it says current period remaining encumbrance. So since the, it's pulling from the current period, that's really the reason why if you want June totals, you're going to have to change it to a June current posting period. And it's based on this. And when you want to run this report retroactively, when you go under your query options, you also want to leave all these options blank. And you ask why? If you put anything in the invoiceable field, whether it's true or false, the system's gonna just look at the status, not the remaining encumbrance. So Classic looked at the statuses of new, partial, or partially filled, partially paid, and completely filled. Redesign does not categorize those statuses, did not bring those over, and the redesign looks at statuses of two things, whether it's invoiceable or whether it's not. So whether the purchase order is open or whether the purchase order is closed. And you also don't want to put any dates in here because under select properties, the current period remaining encumbrance, and we already have the period we're gonna pretend that says June and July. We already changed the current period, so there's no need to put dates in it. So are there any questions so far? I am going to review a few more examples. So someone asks, why is a purchase order that I just adjusted on October 3rd still showing on the outstanding purchase order report as a negative? The reason is the current posting period is still set to September. So that transaction-based report is going to pull any current transactions, which is September. And the adjustment was actually made on October 3rd. Another common question would be, why is an account still showing on an encumbrance on the cash summary report, which again is account-based report. When I run the report without a date or without, or with an as of period 930. And again, the adjustment was dated on October 3rd. The current posting period is September. And an account-based report, again, will pull totals for the current period or the date entered. I want to review one more example regarding this, even though it has nothing to do with posting periods. But I thought I would throw it in since it's in regards to reports and we get a lot of similar questions on this. So for this, I am going to go to the demo site. And the user's question 
or the scenario is my budget summary will not run when I enter a range of objects in the report query. Why? So for example, the user is trying to enter that um, option to get all 400 purchase services as well as all 500 supply accounts. However, um, let me go back to the setup. SSDT template reports operate and are set up with this like operation. All of them are, and it's for consistency. However, these can be changed. So if you want to use a range with wildcards, you have to change this operation. So again, the like operations pre-formatted in this report. So when you go to the object, you could enter a wild card of four parentheses, parentheses for all four hundreds, but it just doesn't accept a comma or a range of accounts like that. So it's more specific. Um, so how would you do that? If you were to change your operation to be one of or between, and I'm gonna show you that and what you would enter as well as the filter value. When the user goes to enter their selection, if this report is set to the one of operation, you could, the user could enter 400 for the purchase services, or they could use a comma and achieve what they were trying to do before. You have to change that operation from like to one of. Now, if, they, if the configure filter was changed to the between operation, then you could enter 400 dot, dot 500. So you have to kind of keep in mind that you can't use the wild cards with the commas and refer to the operation abilities that you can find under the report section in the wiki. And that would be very helpful. The other one last thing to get around that like operation, you could also enter a filter name. So if you had a filter set up for like high school, that's another option of getting your range of what you're looking for for the data. Okay, so that's it on the posting periods. If anybody has any questions, please let me know. And then we'll go, to, if, if not, we'll go to the activity ledger query. Pat, could you please explain a little bit more about opening a closed period and then reclosing it? What will change? Will the like if we are in October and we want to open up July again? I know it was asked in the questions, but I'm not quite sure on what's going on. This is new to me. Um, so I'm opening up. I have to reopen July, but I'm in October. And then I have to close it again because I'm making a change to it in July. So you're, you're making an adjustment to like a transaction, correct? Yes. So yes, you would want to reopen the period to make that transaction change. And you're asking, repeat that question again? Then will I close, I will close it again. I will run the month end close. 
I've not gone through everything yet with USAS. Yeah, when you close a period, um, the report archive will generate the month end reports. Mm -hmm. So you could disable those. However, if you're changing a transaction, I would think that the user would want the new reports to be out there. Right. Um, I don't know in this database if I have reports, I do. Um, I did not mean to go to December, it's not even December. So when you reopen it and close it, you see here where there's two cash summaries. Mm -hmm. That indicates that somebody reopened it for some reason and reran it. You are able to delete these. But I believe, but that's the user's choice. They can either leave it out there or not. Okay. Did I answer your question? I think so. You may get another help desk for me after a while. That's okay. I think about it. I think periods takes a little while to get used to. And that's kind of why I gave that open book scenario about the old days. But you're right, when you have to open up a period to make that transaction. And once you close it, your monthly reports will be generated. Are there any other questions? All right, so we'll, you think of one, just put it in chat or speak up. The next topic is the activity ledger query, and that can be found under the transaction ledger, or menu, sorry. And the activity ledger query it gives you the ability to retrieve a filter, retrieve and filter data from items that you find under the transaction menu. So if you were a classic software user, it's sort of like OINK. You could pull not only just the information on a purchase order, but you can pull the purchase order information, the invoice related to that purchase order, the disbursement, the receipt, refunds, you can pull more information in than just seeing the purchase order. The other capabilities of the activity ledger query is that you can filter further down by using the advanced query button. And I'm gonna show you um, examples of that in a minute. You can highlight a row just for a quick view of the record. You can um, generate a report from any um, grid results that you have displayed. And you can add more columns to your grid for your report if you choose by selecting under the more button. And this is what limits your grid results. It's, it's defaulted lower, so it's more efficient, but it's a minimum of 100 records to a maximum of 2,000 records. We're gonna keep it low though. So a simple example of what you can do on this activity ledger and I'm sure many of you guys have used this, but um, we have the date, the type, the purchase order, and the PO item. And I'm gonna pull up a purchase order. And the dates are all mixed up. And so I want to sort first by type. So I just click on the top row and it re, just, it re sorts it. Then I want to sort a second column, such as the date. And, um, you can hit the shift key 
and then the top of the column. And now it's sorted by type and then second, secondly, by date. So I wanted to show you that in case you didn't know that you could use the shift key for an additional sort. So now I'm gonna show you how do you can use an advanced query to let's say find a donation that you know somebody donated sometime last year and you just can't think of who it was. So first I am going to have to pull into my grid, my activity ledger query, the applicable um, columns. So I don't need purchase order, PO item. What I do need is the type, the received amount, the status. We'll pull in the line number. Receive from description. Okay. So that's a lot of columns. So to further um, sort, I'm going to click on this advanced button. And you see that you have your properties over here. So first, since I'm looking for a receipt, I am going to first query the type of transaction and set my type to equal the receipt. Then since I'm only looking for last year, that I think the donation was sometime last year, I'm going to use the date property and choose greater than or equal to We'll just say January of 2020. I want to pull in the account. So the fund equals 001. And then I'm gonna query by the description because I tend to enter donation in my receipt word donation. So that's what I'm going to sort by. So under receipt item, choose the description. I'm going to choose the operation of contains. And then I'm going to put donation. I can save this query. By typing in the name, such as donation, and just hitting that so that if you wanted to come back to this and maybe change it to the 200 account or whatever, you can do that. And later when you would come in to rerun it, you would, it would normally say load save query, you would come in here and load it. But if you don't want to save it, you don't have to. But you're going to have to, once you pick your operation and filters, you're going to apply your query and your results show down below. So I got stuff in here that I don't really need. But I wanted to show you that it gives me the date that it was received, all the parameters that I wanted on my grid, but it's sorted by the date the type, the fund, and the description. And now I can see who the donations were from, as well as the amount and give the Board of Education the answer. So another example would be to, let's say the treasurer wants all purchase orders with the supply account of 500s to be closed prior to the fiscal year end. 
So again, we're going to have to pick with our more button to remove these um, receipt uh, columns. So click on the more, and I'm going to pull in more. Uh, make sure I have the purchase order data pulled in. So I, I do want the date, the purchase order number, the PO item. I don't need. We'll do the amount. I don't need the user information. So then when we go to the query, advanced query button, so the treasurer wants all purchase orders with a supply account. So I am going to pull over by date. So it's sometime in between July 1st. And today, we'll just pretend it's close to the fiscal year end. We are going to pull in the object. It's under account code. And we're gonna do use the operation of like with the wild card of all 500s. So any 500 with those parentheses will work. And we'll also do just for 001. I am going to bring in the type too so I can identify it as a purchase order. So the type equals purchase order. Oops. Again, you can save it if you wish. But this time, I am going to apply the query. Oops. Okay, so let me see. Sorry about that, that was supposed to work. So let's try. Sorry about that. I'm just going to start over. So let's pull in the date. To be between. through today, we're going to pull in the object in the fund. We're going to put equal the general fund with the object. To be all the 500s and then the type. 
And all I'm doing is clicking. You can also drag to equals PO. And apply my query. Okay. So maybe I'm not seeing what I'm doing wrong. So maybe Amanda can speak up and see if she sees. That, yeah, I think that the date, so when you're using the filters, it's the dot, it's the two dots, or if you're using the grid. I think if you're doing it this way, it might just be a comma though. Let's if you remove both of the dots and then just a comma. And then apply. Mm -hmm. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I know it's it's weird when it's different in there. And then when we're on Zoom, it's okay. So here's all the results and all the purchase orders and the PO items that are in my query, my advanced query that I used. And if you save this and go back to it, you can always go back to say the 300 fund and apply it. And now you get your purchase orders for that particular fund. All right, so sorry about that mix up and thank you, Amanda. I am, I got one more scenario and this is the student activity budget has $1,500 listed on their budget summary. And the student activity advisor knows that they've turned all their purchase orders in and they have no idea what makes up that amount help. So what you can do to find out that encumbrance, we will we'll leave this date now I'm just going to start all over and set up a new advanced query. So again, I'm going to want my fund to be my student activity account. I'm going to do it for a specific Special cost center. So again, equals. I am going to bring it over, and this time I'll drag. I've been clicking, but so that you see that that's possible. Invoiceable equals true. And then I'm going to pull in one more in my advanced query to have the remaining, remaining encumbrance. And this time I'm going to use um, greater than zero. So when I apply that, you can now tell the advisor that it's these purchase orders and these line items with these dates make up that report with the $1,500 encumbrance. So really that is a nice feature on the activity ledger. And hopefully some of those examples like real life examples helped um, show you what it's capable of because it's, it's, it's capable of a lot. All right, so you have any questions on that? All right, so I don't see any. If I'm missing it, just let me know. The next topic is projects. And I'm not sure how many people use this in classic. However, it's another nice feature in the redesign. 
And I'm just going to go to the PowerPoint because I have some good screenshots in here. So projects are used to track like a building project and that project's to date figures. So in classic, this was the screenshot on screen two under account screen where the project to date fields were tracked. So in the redesign, it's, it's similar. I mean, it's gonna do the same function. Um, currently, only one cash account is allowed per project. And you would go to core projects in order to create it. And I'll show you, oops, how in just a second. These icons, well, let me go into the instance. So core, it's right under posting periods, go into the, under projects. And you'll see these familiar icons. And again, if you hover, you'll get tooltips. This is the view, edit, you can delete but you can only delete a project if it has no transactions against it. And this is a new one, but this dollar sign actually assigns the cash account to the project. And I'll show you that in a minute. So we're gonna create a project and link it to a account, uh, cash account. So to be up at the times, so I'm gonna do the COVID-19 project. And then when you set it up, the beginning balance is actually an optional field. But if you enter it, it'll be used to track this for the cash account. So I'm going to enter 200,000. The start and stop dates are, if you want a system to calculate, expended and received amounts for the project, which is why you're using the project ability, then you must have a start date and a stop date. So I'm gonna enter a date and I'm anticipating this to last a couple of years. The grayed out fields is what gets calculated. So we'll click on save. the system will create it. And you'll notice, excuse me. You'll notice that the received amount and expended amount is not populated yet. This indicates that it's not like tied to the cash account. So we still have to assign by using this dollar sign, assign a cash account. So I'll click on that next to the project that I sent up. This Dropbox um, pops up and then you can pick Oops. You can choose your cash account. I'm just choosing this one. Probably doesn't make sense right now, but that's the cash account that I am assigning. So Click assign. When you refresh the page, you will see that those fields are now populated. If the system catches up with me.
Let's try this again. I'm going to use the drop down oops, and choose that same account. Uh oh, three, and then hit assign. And this is what I wanted to show you it populated with the numbers. So use the drop down, just don't enter into that space. And Again, you can go into here. And show you the account. How it's populated once it's tied to the cash account. And you see down here, it also reflects what account that it's a tied to. So the only number, remember, I entered that and the start date. And just by assigning the cash account, it populates and keeps track for you on those numbers. So instead of flipping between projects, grids, and reports, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint because I got some good screenshots in there. I showed you where you entered that information in the drop down, But how you can use these in reports is these fields, these properties can be pulled into like your budget and revenue summary reports. So you could get your legacy period of date expended as well as your period date expended on the budget summary. And you can pull in the property legacy period to date. Like if you had um, amounts in classic prior to migrating to the redesign or the period of date received on the revenue summary reports. So here's an example of the budget summary. Here's your properties on the left where you would just pull it over to um, have that column on your budget summary. And here's an example of the budget summary report with those columns pulled in. So period of date expended is 143.5, and there's nothing for the legacy classic system. The revenue summary report properties, again, they're highlighted right there. They can be pulled over to be columns on your revenue summary report. And again, those are the columns with the period date received of 17,707. So projects can also um, pull in information from the account grids, whether it's the account grids or the project grid. You have those options under amounts the period of date expended or the legacy ones expended. So that can be helpful by grabbing those on the expenditure grid, for example, and using the more button to get those properties selected. And then this example is an example of the project grid, which we were on when we created the project. And these were the amounts that populated after I assigned the cash account. And when you run and pull in that property into the revenue summary report, you see that the period date received matches what's on the project grid. And then if you go to the revenue account, you also see that it's being populated under um, that particular revenue account as well. Okay, so are there any questions on any of those topics that you thought of?
And if there are no questions now and you think of them, um, just send us a chat. I think the next thing that we can do is get up, stretch, get some coffee and take maybe like a five minute break. And then when we, when we all return, Amanda will cover the remaining topics. I was gonna say, I think we do have enough time to do a 15 minute break. So let's, um, well, almost, cause it's 10.01. So let's reconvene at, uh, restart at 10.15. That sounds good. Okay. Thanks cool. everybody. And um, Andrew, I see your question in the chat about the legacy project to date fields. I'm not sure, Pat, I don't know if you know the legacy fields, those, um, the question is like, if you have figures in those, um, will the amounts in that field, if you select a date, um, or do you have to have projects set up in classic to have figures in those legacy fields? Um, or will the amounts in that field to be updated? I think those are just going to be the classic figures and your new figures are in the project to date field. Um, do you, I don't know if you know differently, but I can, I can take a look and get, uh, an actual answer. Yeah, so, I assumed that, but okay. I don't know for sure. Okay. So Andrew, we'll look into it and get you an answer on that one. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Amanda. No problem. All right, so then I pause. Yeah, pause it. Okay, everyone, well, it's 1015. So we're going to um, get restarted here and um, what I want to talk about first for this section is account structure and reporting. Um, we're going to hit this kind of briefly, but I wanted to touch on this as part of this training because I think it's a good thing to um, keep in mind, especially with looking at all of these fields that we can add to um, our grids or our reports. Um, so the first thing is just considering the account structure um, when creating those reports or adding grids to the field. This can become especially important when you're making reports that uh, will be used as CSV or Excel data um, because control breaks don't apply to those types. Um, and when we look at the specific examples, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then also keeping in mind that the properties correspond to fields available for uh, the chosen object. So when you're creating a report, you're pulling that directly from a specific object um, and for the account reports, that would correspond to like your expenditure um, account grid. Um, and so then this does also apply when you're um, using direct totals versus calculating a total via the control break. So um, a lot of these things are easier to actually look at in context. So let me get my um, redesign instance up here. So where I'm gonna look at this, if I go to our account grid, and I'm gonna hop over to the expenditure grid. And actually for this one, I like to have two tabs open because we're gonna look at a couple of different things at once. Um, but the first thing, so when we're looking at this expenditure account grid, um, I can add different options to my grid to be able to view via this more option. And um, when I'm looking at this actual window, let's just move this um, front and center here. So when I look at these different options that I have available to add to this grid, everything that's kind of like um, on the first level here is how I think about it, are things that directly correspond to expenditure account properties. So um, I could um, open the code. This is all going to be the code that's related to each piece of my expenditure account. Um, if I go to these amounts, these amounts are coming directly from my expenditure account. So um, let me open this. See, these are all zero on this one because uh, I just picked my first one here. But if I were to look at fiscal to date expended, then I can actually see that I have um, an actual expended field on here. And if I had figures, adding this column directly from the first level of accounts would add it right from what I see on this pop-up. Now, 
where this comes into play when we start talking about account levels is I can also go drill down into my cash account and then I have figures that come from here. Now, these figures are not coming from this specific page. It's going to actually go to my cash account grid and then start pulling figures from that instead. So I do have a couple of these already on here that I had added before. So if I have my fiscal today expended, my month today expended, um, let me take off the one that has to do with the um, expenditure account. So if we're just looking at cash account figures here, and then let me let that reload. And then go back to my expenditure grid. What I'm gonna see in these columns now, so there's my month to date, and then let's see, here's my fiscal to date expended. So what these columns are now representing is the month to date and the fiscal to date for my cash account. Now, the way that I'm looking at this grid is that my cash account for the 001000 special cost center is all first. So these figures are exactly the same for every single uh, row. And that makes sense because they all have the same cash account. Um, so when you're adding these columns, um, first of all, like I don't really know that that's super helpful to see. I think that there are better ways that you could go see that month to date and um, fiscal today expended for the cash account. The other thing to consider with this, so if you're adding something from a higher level from cash account or appropriation account, is that the system is now having to calculate that for every single row. So if you add these columns, if you were to add a lot of columns to this expenditure grid that are pulling from higher levels and having to calculate um, each time, that is something that could definitely diminish performance of this page. So um, definitely something to consider uh, when you're picking out which uh, fields you wanna add on there. Similarly, if you added a field like this to a budget summary report that um, pulls at the expenditure level, you're also gonna get repetitive information there too. Um, so let's go look, I'm going to take my second tab just so we can kind of visualize where this is coming from. And if I go to my cash account, then I can see, all right, so here is my um, general fund, my cash account that I have um, at the top of my other grid. And I can see here's my fiscal today expended. That's the same figure that I'm seeing there. And if I open this up, I see my month to date is that 1000. So those figures that we're seeing duplicated on the other grid, this is where they're coming from. Um, let's go to my reports now. So um, the other place that I mentioned this is relevant is when we are um, looking at the at adding fields to a report instead of adding fields to a grid. Um, so when I come in here, right up in this top corner, this is where I can see the object. Um, the object corresponds to you know what what I'm pulling these fields from. So for, especially for these um, account based reports, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, where I have my expenditure account, there is an object for a cash account or um, my appropriation account, I could pull directly from there. So if you are um, customizing one of these reports or maybe you are trying to create a report from scratch, uh, that is pretty important to think about when you're trying to figure out like what kind of totals you actually wanna see on your report. And then just like the more option, um, again, here's where I think about it sort of as levels, is everything that's kind of on my main um, menu here that I don't have to like drill down to see, um, this is coming from my expenditure account. So I have, you know, fiscal today expended. This is going to be coming directly from my expenditure. 
But if I were to start opening these categories, like go down into cash account and then start grabbing figures from here uh, with these encumbrances. And um, when I hover too, I can see that it says cash account per encumbrances. If I add that to my report, it's going to be the same encumbrance total for everything that has that cash account. Now, there are ways where like, um, you can kind of get these totals on the reports by just having everything add up. So uh, this report is, you know, for all the expenditure accounts, I have my cash account that is giving me a control break. So that gives subtotals. So if I were to run this report and then um, look at my subtotals or if I run it in summary version, so it just gives me my totals, I will get the total per cash account. Um, but again, I can only use that option if I'm doing this as a PDF. If I wanted cash account totals and I wanted to have it on a CSV, I would need to be pulling a report that pulls from the cash account object, which would be your cash summary. And I can customize from there to go add different things. Um, but that's just a really important thing to keep in mind um, as you're building reports or as you um, are you know, maybe customizing. And so um, just in the PowerPoint we have, uh, here's an example of this um, account grid. So this is your expenditure grid. And then this shows that, you know, um, you have that category for the cash account and adding those totals. And it also included this, um, this graphic of the account structure. I think there's something like this in the USAS manual as well. Um, but sometimes I feel like it's good just to go back to this visual to keep in mind that you know, under each cash account, there could be several appropriation accounts. There could be um, several expenditure accounts under that. So when you're considering, you know, that you're adding totals maybe from, you know, this group of expenditure accounts, um, the total of everything for this grouping would be the same total as the appropriation that um, all of those are under. So I guess just the thought of like, sometimes there's an easier way to pull information instead of, you know, instead of having a total of all of these, that's gonna be the straight figure for, you know, this appropriation or the total of all of these will be the same total as the cash account. It's hard to get a good example of this one. Um, I, I kind of wanted to touch on it, but I um, don't wanna, I think I'm going to leave it pretty much there. If this is something that you run into um, when you're building your reports, I think it's a good thing to have in your mind um, to consider. But certainly if there are more specific situations and um, you're looking for a different way to maybe like grab a total or build a report um, and you think maybe there is a different like level you can use, that's definitely something that we can um, help you out with. So let us know. <laughs> The next thing I'm gonna move into here is talking about um, pending transactions. I really wanted to hit this one in our intermediate training because this, um, this one is a little bit uh, more to wrap your head around because it does have pieces that come from the USPS side and then you're posting those um, transactions into USAS and so some of the information is coming from different places. There are ways that the information can connect. So let's go back to our instance here. So um, in on the USAS side, I have my transaction pending transactions page. And once items are pushed over from the USPS side, this is where I'm going to be able to see anything that's been um, sort of transferred over, submitted over. And I can filter this grid by type. So I have a bunch out here that I kind of put so we can um, take a look at these. Um, I have distribution type. Uh, so that is um, basically like your board disk uh, files. I have a payroll submission. 
And then I have some employer retirement share files out here. Now, um, these, uh, the first ones are the distribution files. So these are created with the employer distribution um, from the USPS side. And on that side, uh, they would put in, you know, a certain date range. Maybe they're pulling the employer distributions for a pay or for the month. Um, and then they're going to go ahead and uh, submit that over. It could be for um, one or more um, uh, payroll item codes. But um, in this case, I just have one payroll item code uh, that was included with this. I can open this up and look, and I have detail on the different account codes that it would post to, um, the dates that were used. Uh, the date that, that this was created and sent over is what's gonna show in this date field. And then on the payroll side, each of the different um, payroll items can be set up with a payee. The payees can be used for multiple things in the USPS side because they have um, they have payroll items that are uh, their employee paid or they have ones that are employer paid. So we're talking about employer, but those payees can also be used for that other purpose as well. Um, and that gets processed through the payables on that side for the employee um, payment. And I'm so sorry, I'm having a hard time still with uh, payroll item versus deduction code. So I'm trying to make sure I say the right thing. But if it seems a little awkward, it's because I have to stop myself from saying deduction code. <laughs> um, so when I go to post this, uh, here's one of the questions that we get a whole lot is, do I have to select this payee vendor? Um, you know, and uh, like, how's that going to work, basically? So I can see, I could see in this background, I have the Sycamore Cafe, I have the payee name and address. That information is defined in USPS. So um, that um, basically, basically the payee information is normally used for the employee, um, the employee payroll items. Um, but what we can do is also kind of use those as well to connect to the USAS side if needed. So this payee vendor, um, basically when I post this, it's going to make it into a purchase order. I have the option to choose a vendor now to attach to it, or I can wait and attach it at the PO stage. So do you have to use this drop down? No. But if I don't, I will still have to pick a vendor at the next step. Let's look at that first. I actually have two of these, so we can do it both ways. Um, but the other thing while we're here that I want to hit is talking about this transaction date. So the transaction date is going to come over. This is the same one I can see in the background. Uh, this is the date that the submission file was sent over. But if I want to change this to the current date, I can do that on this screen before I create the purchase order. Um, now, this is really important, especially if you're like at the end of the month, um, you know, and it's supposed to be within a specific month. So if I submitted it over, you know, before the month ended, but I want to post it in the current month, you know, I'm, I would need to uh, be conscious of this at this point. So let me go ahead and post that. And I get some warnings if I have a negative balance. And then where this is going to go is over to the transactions. And I'm going to go to my purchase orders. And I can see right in here that I have my purchase order. It gets created. It doesn't necessarily have to have uh, the vendor at this point. Like I can do that when I invoice, uh, or I could edit this and add a vendor. Um, but certainly when I invoice, I'll have to at least pick a vendor at that point. Um, but in the description, I do have the information, at least the payee name. And if there was a payee number that is included in here. So if they have the payee number set to the same thing as the vendor, like that can still be helpful um, at this stage for attaching it. The 
if we go back, so let's look at the alternative now. Nope, I click purchase order again. Sorry about that. I'm going to pending transactions. Um, so my distribution, so I'm gonna go ahead, come in here. And if I post this now, change my date, and it's gonna be, so 4549, um, so if I uh, wanna go ahead, select this. So this is Sycamore Bakery, but uh, maybe that's the vendor that I wanna use. I can select this at this stage, post it, and then it'll include that as the vendor on my purchase order so that when I go through the invoicing step, I don't have to go find it at that point. Another thing that I can do at this stage is use this apply payee name and address to the vendor. What this does is the payee information is contained in USPS. If this is, so this is an employer, um, an employer paid like payroll item um, or portion of it, then that payee information might, I mean, logically, like it makes sense if the person who usually works in the USPS side is the one that's going to be maintaining uh, that information for uh, the vendor of like where it's supposed to get paid. So if they update the information on the USPS side, when I come into USAS, do I want to use that name and address update? So say the address changed, you know, they changed it over in USPS, like, do I want to bring that to USAS too, or do I want to go manually update that vendor? Um, so basically what this does, if I check this, it's going to take the information that I can see in the background here, that's the information from USPS, and it's going to update that on the vendor record for the vendor that I've selected. So in this case, the um, name is Sycamore Cafe instead of Sycamore Bakery, and I have a different address. I have um, Saval Avenue instead of Mercury Road. So if I want this information that came from USPS to be updated on my USAS vendor, that's why I'm selecting that option. Go ahead and post that. And now we're going back to the purchase orders. And I can see if I come in here, um, my vendor name is still showing Sycamore Bakery. I may have um, misspoke on that, but uh, my address is updated. We'll go check on this vendor, um, double check that. But it does attach the vendor here. So it's 4549 um, instead of me having to do that at the invoice step. And now I'm just on the core vendor page. And so my primary name is Sycamore Bakery, but it's, it is our location name. So if I come down here and look at my location, uh, this is where the check's gonna get cut. It does update the Sycamore Cafe down here so that when I do actually process a disbursement and cut a check for this, it would actually um, match the information that was from the USPS side. And then the payee ID, um, this information just comes over. This is basically just a link from information in USPS. So that kind of comes over um, since we're pushing that information um, to connect the two sides. So um, that's nothing that you have to like manually update or worry about, but you will see that there um, as part of the USPS integration section. Um, okay, so um, also while we're talking about these, I'm going to pull up my uh, USPS instance as well. And let's go look at this payroll item. So payroll item configuration. And I know we're um, 
use us today. So I'm just going to be in here briefly. But since this part connects, I just want um, you to also be able to see the other side of this and where it's coming from. So my payroll item configuration is basically the setup for this code. And if I open this up here, let me do edit so we can see it a little bit more. So um, my 543, this is what I created that, um, that disbursement from. And I can see right here that it's attached to this payee. So that's where that information um, came over. That's how it was attached. And the second place that I can look is on the payee page. And I have it, it's my second one right here. So um, let me do edit so I can open this up. So the number that's attached here, uh, it is optional on the USPS side. It was pretty convenient for this example because that was the same as the vendor number. Um, so as like a setup piece, if that's something uh, that you're helping your districts with, like it may be convenient to, if there is a vendor, um, if this code is being used for um, an employer paid, um, a, a employer paid figure that you do want to put the same as the vendor number in there. You don't have to, uh, but that you can see, you know, how we use it in this example, that could be helpful. The name on this payee, so this is where um, that information was coming from. We use that to update our vendor on the USAS side um, for the uh, payment information. And then here's where the address and everything um, was being pulled from that we just saw for that update. The other question that we've gotten is about this electronic payment checkbox. So this electronic payment checkbox on the USPS side, so we're in payroll, this does not have an effect on the USAS check. This checkbox is only going to be used within the USPS side for the um, employee paid deductions. Still have the vendor up. Um, when we're looking at the vendor here, there. So I switched back to USAS. I'm sorry, I'm not hopping around too fast. <laughs> but back in USAS, if we look at this vendor, the default payment type on that actual vendor that we're selecting when we invoice this, or you know when we post it, this is what's going to control USAS. So don't let that trip you up. Um, certainly, if this payee on the USPS side, certainly if this payee is um, only being used for the for the amounts that are getting pushed to USAS anyway. If you wanted to, you know, check or uncheck that for like kind of like a record keeping keeping to make it easy to see if if that vendor is electronic, you could manually check that. Um, but that's not going to actually update anything when you post. Um, let's see. Okay. And then let's see. So, um, sorry, I keep flipping back and forth, but I'm in USPS again, um, just to have a brief like view. So this under the USAS integration, the employer distributions submission. Um, this is the page where they would be entering in the dates and selecting the payroll item um, and then creating and um, submitting um, over to USPS or USAS, I'm sorry. Uh, the other type of files that they can send over. So um, next I'm going to talk about the employer retirement share submission. So again, in USPS, here's where they'd be able to enter uh, start and end dates and STRS and SERS amount. Um, so this is the classic board ret. So I know not everybody uses this, um, but similar um, situation for them submitting it over. Uh, they would basically submit from this page. And then when we go back to, let's get back to our pending transactions page. Um, I have these bottom two here. Oops bottom three actually I was playing around with this earlier so I had it, it will submit um, if there are amounts for both an SERS and an STRS files when 
um, you process that. I just have two SDRS because I was playing with it earlier and I posted the SDRS already. Um, but here's what these look like. So if we open this up, um, you'll see that I have um, a summary of what's included here. I have the dates that it was created for. And then a payee name and if there's address information. So for this one, it actually didn't have any information entered into the payee. So we can see that this looks a bit different. When I go to post this as well, because I don't have any um, address information included in the USPS side, obviously it's not going to give me the, um, the ability to update that. This works the same, um, you know, with we want to pick the date, uh, we want to post it, uh, we could select a vendor now or we could wait to select a vendor. Uh, the same concept as we talked about with the um, employer distribution. So that is all um, basically the same process there. Uh, let me pull my PowerPoint back up though. Because what I do want to note on this one, um, this is different than classic. Um, and I've seen, we've gotten a couple of tickets where people have run into some differences with this. Um, in redesign, the account that is selected to be used, um, the object is based on the pay account and not if the employee is um, defined as certified or classified. So the account code that they're getting paid with, you know, is that per the USAS manual designated as a certified, um, account code, like a certified object, then it's going to use what's defined, um, what what object code you have defined for certified. Um, let me go back. So um, I'm back in USPS now. And um, I'm just gonna go back to that payroll item configuration. Um, so this is where we were looking at where the payee was attached. And so SERS, if I open up this configuration, I can see that there's um, a certified object, a classified object, or an other object. So the way the system is going to determine which one of these is used is based on what account they were paid out of and what that's designated as. So I know that's a little bit different. Um, basically, what I would recommend is that they can run the report for employer retirement share um, ahead of actually creating the submission. So I would recommend that everyone review those accounts carefully. If there's a discrepancy, um, obviously the pay is probably already like said and done, but uh, if this is SERS and you're like, well, hey, that should always be classified, you could change all of these to be 221. And then no matter what the pay account is, um, you know, it would use those, but, it is kind of a good catch though, because if they're, you know, classified, like I don't know, they probably shouldn't be getting paid out of a certified account um, code, but you know, I'm sure there are cases where it can happen. Um, but that's an easy way around it is to just update these to all be the same if that's, you know, what your district wants to do. But that's kind of the gotcha that we see with the uh, retirement share. Okay, um, the next one I'm gonna talk about is the payroll submission. So uh, yeah, let's hop back into the software for this. Okay, and then let me make sure I'm in the USAS side. So, okay, so I'm in USAS. I'm um, again on my pending transaction still. And now I wanna look at my payroll submission. So um, when I pull this up, you know, I can see I still have the date, my description, uh, my detailed information here. And um, when I go to post this, if I open this up, you'll notice I don't have the same like vendor option. I have some different options here. A huge difference with posting payroll versus the other files that we looked at is that it's going to skip the purchase order and invoice stage. This is going to basically like take it right to 
uh, the disbursement stage. So um, you don't have like, you don't have to do the same options basically, but what you do have to define is if you want it to be an electronic uh, disbursement or you want it to be a check type. With the electronic type disbursements, you can assign a check number, but you're not gonna be able to like generate a print file with that check number. So you're not gonna be able to get an XML file um, with a check number on it. So if that's something that the district needs, you know, either they, they like to print it or if they have a third party where they need to have it attached, um, you may want to make sure that they're unchecking this so that it can process as a check type. Uh, the other thing with electronic checks is that technically they aren't are never like printed. So that uh, column that says if it's printed true or false, that will always say false for electronic disbursements. Um, so that's just something else to note. I have my transaction date uh, again, especially around the end of the month. Uh, this is something that they really want to pay attention to before posting this is that the transaction date that they're choosing is within the month that they want. Um, so if they do choose the wrong date, um, since there's not a purchase order, like you can't just void this disbursement and then like repost it with a different date, uh, what you would need to do to be able to fix that is uh, you could regenerate a file through USPS but you can only do that within a specific time range. So it has to be before they process the outstanding payables. So it's really important to pay attention at this step because um, it's not, depending on what stage of the process that they're in, like it may or may not be easy to correct. And then the bank account. So um, if they use multiple bank accounts, they would be able to pick a bank account that uh, would be connected to the disbursement. And once we're happy with these options, let's make this, let's make this check type. All right, we'll go ahead and post that. Oh, and before I did that too, I was gonna mention the validate. So certainly you can validate any of these files beforehand and um, review like warnings or errors that pop up uh, for the sake of this today. Like I kind of wanted to go through the posting options. So we haven't really looked at that, but um, that's definitely an option that they can be using before they post is to uh, just to validate. Um, so I'm going to go to my disbursements grid so that we can take a look at this disbursement. And I think we're done in USPS. So let me also get out of here so that we don't end up anywhere we don't want to be. Um, Let's see. Oh, so we'll see this when we get to the disbursement grid, but um, we didn't have the option to select a vendor at that stage. But also, um, you know, when we get into the grid, we're going to see that uh, the disbursement uses the organization information instead. So it's using that um, information from USPSR uh, for that uh, the payee info. So I have this first one here, I made it a check um, and I can open this up and see that I do have a payee name and address that lists in here. And I have my detail information and I could go ahead and um, if I needed to you know, generate a print file, attach a check number, I can do that through this grid then. But I do have it posted to my books now. And this is the file for the uh, full gross payroll. Yes, okay, I think we covered all of this, okay. Okay, so yeah, the next part that I'm gonna jump into is the modules. We're gonna be kind of um, Popping around to the different pages, looking at um, what those modules add to different sections in the system. Uh, before we move on to that, though, are there any questions about um, either of those first two sections?
Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So we'll go ahead and move on. Um, the modules, I'm gonna go through uh, most of these, at least um, make sure we hit the ones that um, change things on different pages. Uh, but as far as where the setup is, so under system modules, this is something that administrative users would have access to. Um, and something that you're probably visiting, um, I mean, you're, you're gonna review this when you migrate the district over, when you're setting them up, but there are definitely things that you might come in that may change um, as they go along if there are different things that the district wants to uh, start doing. The first one we're gonna talk about here is the ACH processing module. Um, this one, and actually, you know what, I think because I've been in here um, preparing, <laughs> I have most of the modules that we're going to talk about on, but let's just look at um, installing or uninstalling a module. So I can tell that these are enabled because I have a minus over here, which would uninstall it, um, or I have this check mark here that shows me which modules are enabled. If I wanted to um, install a module that's not installed, I would just click the plus here. And then it's gonna take a minute, my page is gonna load. Um, and then that's going to make the um, proper changes to the system. So this is probably kind of a big one, so this might take a minute. Um, okay, well, while that's loading, so it's going to update. Um, the other thing that I can see on this page is that down at the bottom here, I have a bunch of grayed out modules. And these are all enabled. So these are the ones that the system requires. Uh, usually I just, I don't even, I kind of forget that these are even here because these are things that, you know, when you um, get everything set up, um, they're automatic, you can't change them. Um, you don't really need to worry about those. So those are all um, like the mandatory ones. And then at the top, this is really just your optional ones. Um, so that installed this accounts receivable module. Uh, that does add uh, an option to our uh, menu up here, but it says this change may not take full effect until the page is refreshed. Um, and that's because it's actually updating things that we would see. So we can click there to refresh the page. And then now I can see that accounts receivable module is installed. If I wanted to uninstall one of these, then um, I could go ahead and um, you know, click that again and it would you know, uncheck the box and it would um, remove you know, what, what it's added for that module so that it wouldn't be available. So with that said, um, the first one, I'm just going to kind of go down the list for the ones I want to talk about here. And the first one is this ACH processing module. Um, now, currently, uh, creating ACH files in USAS is not available. Um, but as with Classic, there are certain fields that can be used. And then if those are filled out, um, some third party applications use those fields to be able to create uh, an ACH tape file in uh, within the third party software. So like, for example, Edge is one that I've worked with a lot, where um, basically what you're going to do in USAS is create um, like a check file or a disbursement file. But if there are certain pieces included, once it gets over to Edge, it's going to make that an ACH tape instead. Um, so turning on this module enables the fields that can be filled out uh, to be able to enter information for that process. Um, so once that's enabled, I would go to the vendor page to see what this is added. And when I'm entering my vendor information here, if I scroll down this um, ACH info section, so all of these different uh, fields here in this section, uh, those will be available once that's installed. If it's not installed, I wouldn't even see those at all. Now, it may vary depending on the third party vendor of what they'll need filled out. Um, but generally, you know, they would need to have all of these different um, fields, the account number, the type, the code. Um, and then usually they also want the email address filled out. Um, 
but certainly if that's something that you are helping a district set up, you would want to check with that third party to make sure that um, you've got everything that they require so that once the information gets over to that side, um, they can use it appropriately. The ACH active checkbox, uh, one thing to note, this is just a USAS field. So eventually, um, you know, there is a plan for us to write something in that would allow you to um, create files within USAS. Um, but since that's not currently available, this is not something that's used, this ACH active is not something that's used to connect over with any third parties. Um, basically, this is just something that you would at the current time use, um, you could use to like sort or filter a grid. So, you know, if you uncheck this or check this, like, and you're using a third party, that's not necessarily going to make a change um, to whether it's being used or not. You'd have to actually like figure out with the third party if there's something that, you know, if that's not filled out or something like that. Um, how they would be able to utilize it. So right now, if I check this and then I add that to my grid, that would be a really handy thing that I could use to filter my grid to see um, any vendors that I have, um, you know, with ACH info maybe. But certainly in the future, once we get, um, you know, additional updates where we're actually using those fields, that will be um, utilized differently. Next is our classic requisition approval module. So um, for this one, it enables a couple fields on your requisition record. And also um, it adds a transmitted status to the purchase order. So we'll go take a look at these fields. Um, but what this is used for is third party software that transfers approval information back to redesign. And I just noticed that I didn't put this on my slide, but I intended to um, for that second bullet point. So third party software that transfers approval back is not RAM. So I know that's caused some confusion before. So if districts use RAM, they do not need these fields um, entered in since RAM doesn't actually send anything back. So um, just to like avoid any confusion with that. Um, because once these fields are added, requisitions can only be converted after that approval status is changed to approved. Um, so you don't want to accidentally turn this on and have them, you know, not be able to convert their requisitions. Just want to make a note to update this. So I'll update this um, spreadsheet and then, uh, I'm sorry, spreadsheet. <laughs> I'll update this PowerPoint and then repost this to um, the intermediate training page so that if you're pulling down this uh, PowerPoint to use later, that'll be on there. Um, and then Jason says, same thing with OnBase. Don't check that um, for the requisition approval module. Okay, and let's go back here. So we're going to transaction and requisitions. And when we open this up, these are um, right in the middle here. So I have the approval status and the workflow context. And so those aren't necessarily things that the user has to update once this is on here. Um, those will be updated you know, by the information that's pushed back from the um, approval system. And on the purchase order, it's going to be this transmitted checkbox right down here under the modified date. So that's an optional field that can be used to signify that uh, the purchase order has been sent to the vendor. Okay, and we've got some screenshots of those fields on here as well. The next module is the EIS integration. 
So when this one is enabled, this adds the EIS uh, classic configuration to our configuration page. Um, on here, you can set the threshold um, and the automatic options. These are the same as classic. Uh, if the district did have this um, turned on in classic, that will come over. Um, it'll bring over the threshold and the automatic settings. And um, basically what this is going to do is it's gonna be the setup um, that'll determine if invoices uh, higher than the threshold are going to be uh, marked as an EIS item. So depending on the object code and the amount, uh, there's a little checkbox when you're invoicing that will mark this um, for the EIS system so that when the inventory pending extract report is um, created, it's going to be able to include the items that are relevant. And let's go back here. So I'm going first to the system configuration. And within here, I have EIS classic integration configuration. And when I pop this up, so I can see um, that I can enter my threshold and then I have a checkbox for that automatic option, um, which basically determines if it's gonna be like 500 object codes or 500 and 600 object codes, it's gonna automatically get checked. When I go to uh, my purchase order, and gosh, I don't know if I have one that's got the right uh, codes on here. So we're just going to kind of wing it and um, look at invoicing this one. Because we should still be able to see the checkbox either way. Okay. So um, when I'm going to invoice, like I would come in here and I just kind of put my amount in my um, item status. And if I scroll all the way over, there's an inventory item checkbox. And so um, if it meets those specific, specific parameters, then this would automatically get checked so that it can be included on the extract. And then what you're gonna do is pull that um, extract report and then that can be at the current time imported into classic so that um, you can have the pending items that can be used to create um, invoice, or I'm sorry, uh, inventory records. All right, so this next one is the email notification services. Um, this one uh, is, I don't know, I'd say pretty commonly used. If you want to be uh, sending reports via email, you're definitely going to need to set this one up. Enabling the module is going to add the email configuration to your system configuration page. But there are a couple steps uh, once you add the module where you're going to have to go set this up. So we're going back to our system configuration. And here's our email configuration right here. So um, when you come in here at first, it'll have some standard settings like the SMTP host is gonna say local host, I think, and then um, it won't have like a default from address. But when you're setting this up, so the SMTP host, this is something, um, I think it just basically depends on the server that you're intending to send uh, emails through, but you, you're basically using this to connect uh, USAS to your network. So um, when I was at the ITC, this is something that our tech team was able to uh, provide. Um, and basically, um, your host and then potentially your port information would be updated with um, whatever information that is uh, like for your ITC uh, likely, unless the district is sending it, you know, through their, through their own, but um, I think that'll just kind of depend on your situation. Uh, the default from address, so this email address that's going to be used here is what um, your reports are going to come from or any messages that are coming from the system, that's what it's going to show that the email is um, being sent from. 
Uh, the important thing there is to make sure that whatever that email address is and whatever like domain it's being sent from uh, has access to be able to send through this host. So um, I'm no expert on um, net, the networking side of it or how that works, but um, I do know that that was something that was relevant. Um, you know, when we were setting it up when I used to be at NITC is that if there was, you know, an email address that didn't have certain authorization, sometimes there are filters on that. So um, when you're configuring this, you know, that may be a relevant thing to um, check with your team on to make sure that if this needs to be some kind of specific email address um, that you're aware of that and able to um, set that up appropriately. The default administrator address. So this one, um, it's up to you if you want to enter an email in here or not. Uh, basically, at this point, that's not being utilized differently. Uh, like that's not really being used. Um, in the future, there may be messages that could be sent, um, you know, and come from like a separate administrator address. But right now, we're just using the default from address. So, uh, you know, you could fill it out with the same email, um, but you don't really have to. And once you have those things, um, you're gonna save that up. And there is one more thing that I would advise to look at when you are um, coming in here and doing this configuration. And that is gonna be this application configuration. So if I open this up, this, um, when you are working with just like a regular uh, district, uh, you know, that you maybe you've spun them up, you migrated them over, this should be production type. So that's going to be a live instance. Um, mine's a demo instance, so that's why I have it set to production. Um, and then I have these checkboxes for external notification and for job execution. So in order to be able to send emails outside of the system, I need to make sure that this external notification enabled is checked. Now, um, there are situations where this might be something different. So maybe you have a training database or like um, support is uh, what we use when um, we have like a backup of an instance. And in that case, it might look like this where these aren't checked. So yeah, so say I took a copy of a district for um, you know testing or support. This is what I would expect it to look like. So by default, it's set to not be able to send external notifications, and that's so that you're not accidentally sending, having like duplicate of reports send. So yeah, say they have like a report scheduled to go out to their principals every Friday. If I take a backup, I don't want them also getting one from my test database. Um, certainly, if you are testing something that you know, has to do with those, you could, you know, as long as you're careful and make sure that nothing's going to send that you don't want to, you know, there may be situations where you have to come in here and enable these. Um, but, you know, obviously I advise caution on that one. So, um, yeah, so that nothing's, nothing's running that you don't want it to. Um, but especially if you are setting up something that, you know, you do intend to be a production instance, you want to make sure that, that that's also enabled. Otherwise, that could be um, a reason that your emails aren't going through. Um, Brenda asks, would we unmark that if we're just setting up a district or training with them? Um, I don't know that you necessarily have to. I think it depends on like, you know, how much you've set up or like if there are things that you do or don't want to send. Um, normally it's with districts that have been like up and going that I would see automatic reports that they've scheduled to send to different people in the district. Uh, but if they're training, they probably don't have anything set up yet. So uh, likely you'd be good to just, you know, leave it as like a production instance and, and have those enabled so that they can kind of test those when they're training. Um, so yeah, I would say that you don't have to. Will this stop email direct deposit slips if unchecked? Um, well, right now we're looking at the USAS side. So if I do anything over here, it's not going to stop those from the USPS side. Um, I believe they do have this same option in USPS. Um, 
unchecking the external notification probably would, but I would say that that's, I would, I would address it differently though. Um, likely you want to go actually look at the job. Um, Rhonda says she has a test USPS currently and it's unchecked. Yeah, so this, um, like if it is support or, um, you know, a different type of instance, if it's not production, then um, yeah, likely it'll um, be unchecked. And yeah, it would. So I'm sorry, now I'm thinking about it, like if we're talking about it in the context of like pulling a backup of a USPS instance, then, you know, yeah, those settings would be unchecked so that it doesn't send like duplicate, duplicate uh, direct deposit slips. So yeah, that's a good point. But if you have a situation where you actually are like trying to stop um, a round of, of direct deposits that you've scheduled, there's probably a different way to address that. So would it do it? Yes, but in certain situations, it's not necessarily a solution. <laughs> okay, so let's see, um, uh, we've hit that, okay. The next one I wanna talk about is um, legacy password migration. So I don't know how often this option has been used, um, but I threw it on here because I, I don't know that's something that's been talked about a whole lot. Um, this isn't like your standard option, but it is something that you know could potentially be used if it's something that you need um, for a, either a larger district or a district that has a lot of users. You know, maybe they um, you know have teachers that enter recs directly into redesign, um, something like that. So when a district migrates from classic to redesign, uh, normally with passwords, you would uh, like set a new password for each one of the users. Because of how the passwords are, um, because of how they work with the VMS system, it's not possible to actually bring those passwords over to redesign. But what we can do instead is allow a way where they could reset their own password. So you wouldn't have to like go in, reset it, provide them a password. There's a link here. Um, and this links to our technical uh, documentation. And this goes through a bit more detail on what I have on this slide on how to do this. Because um, basically you're going to enable um, this module, you're going to have to restart the instance, and then you're also going to have to update a configuration setting. But what happens at that point is that um, it'll allow the system to recognize that the user has access, but it'll treat their password as it's expired. So then they're going to have to go into the password change option, and they can enter their um, own new password. So that may kind of, um, you know, ease the burden if there is a situation with a lot of users. So if that's something that um, you're interested in uh, doing for a district, definitely check out that um, this link that's on here that gives you the full um, article. Next, I'm going to talk about the pre-encumbrance module. So what this one does is it adds requisition amounts to, uh, I, I'm sorry, requisition amount and future requisitions um, amounts to the core accounts page. And then it also gives you access to um, bring this figure onto your reports. And this does impact the remaining balance. So this is something that you may or may not want to have turned on. Uh, this does correspond to a classic um, setting. So if this was something that they had turned on in classic, it, it will bring it over. Um, and then, you know, whether they do or don't want to use that, like you may have to enable or disable this one. So let's touch base back at our modules page. I just want to make sure I have this one turned on. I do. So let's see, we've hit these. Yeah, we're down here at our pre-encumbrance module. So I'm going to my core accounts page and I'm going to the expenditure grid.
And once I get here, um, I can look at one of these records and um, this requisition amount right here, this field is added. If I disable that module, it's gonna remove that so that it just won't even appear here. Um, and then future year requisitions, this will be populated with amount as well if uh, the district is adding requisitions, you know, in a future fiscal year posting period. So if it's June and they're adding them for July for this account, it would include the total there as well. And um, on this pop-up, of course, it's really handy that we can see that it's doing this calculation of, you know, the initial amount plus minus equals this. So when we look at this requisition amount, I can see that um, what this is doing um, when it's going to do these calculations is whatever my um, my unencumbered balance is minus my future encumbered minus my requisition amount is what's going to display as my remaining balance. So like we looked at earlier, you know, you can go pull these fields onto reports or onto your grid. If I'm pulling the remaining balance for my expenditure accounts onto a report, I'm gonna to have to keep in mind that that is going to take into account requisition amounts if I have this module turned on. Um, I have a chat. If the pre-encumbrance module is not installed, we found that users do not receive warnings errors when keying requisitions. Do you agree? Um, I'd have to check on that. Um, I know we're gonna talk about the simple balance checking uh, module um, that works with some rules and that does have to do with, um, that does work with the pre-encumbrance module. So it's possible, but I don't know 100% off the top of my head, Carrie. So I'm gonna have to check on that. Um, let's see. So with that, let's actually roll into this um, simple balance checking module. So again, this replicates an option from Classic. Um, and this on this slide, I actually did bring in a little screen cap. This is what it looks like in the Classic USA Con. Um, this first option that we see on this um, actually is track, rec track requisition amounts. So that's the pre-encumbrance module basically. Um, so if that's yes, that means the same thing as pre-encumbrance modules turned on. Um, and then these second two um, options is what you're getting with the simple balance checking module. Um, and then, and this is why I'm kind of thinking that, um, you know, like what Carrie's uh, had asked about, you know, you would need to have the pre-encumbrance module on is because I do know in classic, these second two options, you didn't have the option to say yes or to put a warning unless this first one was yes. So it very well could work the same in um, redesign. You know what, I'm sorry, I just wanted to make a note about that as well. Um, so for specifically for these balance checking options, um, this is used in combination with that pre-encumbrance module, and um, it'll allow those amounts to be used in the balance checking for requisitions and for encumbrances. Uh, these are the rules that can be used um, to be enabled. Um, and then that will depend if you want like errors or warnings. So let's go back here. And I'm gonna to go to our system rules page. Okay, so um, here we go. So here's our different rules. Um, I have some future PO and future rec ones, um, or I have my purchase order and my requisition on appropriation or the um, budget level. And here's where I have like a warning or error, um, or I could add uh, warnings to the requisitions.
All right, so um, next is talking about the USPS integration module. This one, um, unless you have a district that's, you know, only using USAS, um, then you're probably gonna have this enabled. Um, it must be enabled for USAS to communicate with USPSR. So this integration is the reason that uh, we could push over the submission files that we looked at earlier. So uh, that employer uh, distribution submission and um, the payroll submission, being able to connect that over happens through this module. Uh, this will likely be uh, enabled when you um, migrate the district over. And this also um, allows the account sync to happen. When this is enabled, uh, the USPS configuration um, through the system configuration page. So that, that's what's added with this along with your little drop down at the top um, on the top menu. And um, again, I have a note here that this is gonna automatically update on import. Um, but test instances can also be linked. So actually had to do this for this training since we're looking at both sides. Um, but when you are setting up like test and training instances, this may not uh, like automatically link together um, or enable depending on you know how you set it up. So I know ours are not always um, linked. So I'm um, going to modules and USPS integration module. So I just wanna make sure that's turned on in my system configuration. Uh, let's see, going down to USPS configuration, I can see um, this information set up here. And again, I, this is pretty much always, um, you know, automatically populated for most situations. So I don't usually have to um, do anything here, but if I do see these fields as blank, then that's a way that I can tell that this is not connected to USPS. Um, but if I say, say it is blank and I need to connect together a USAS and a USPS instance for like testing purposes or something like that, uh, where I would go is to my USPS integration and I could go to security configuration. And yeah, this is definitely something you would be doing at the ITC level. This is not anything that um, you would be, um, you know, having to teach your districts on. Um, and then I'm going to get my USPS instance back up here. So on the USPS side, there's um, a similar option where you would need to set up the USAS integration, make sure that's installed. And um, when I come into here, I also have security configuration. So I'm basically opening the same page in both USAS and USPS. Uh, when you come in here, these fields might be blank. So like, this is what it might look like to start. I come in here, I'd see that there's you know nothing in there. And then um, I have, and actually these top two might be blank too. So I have this option to generate an API key. So I'm gonna click this. All right, I'm gonna generate the, the API key. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna give me these first two boxes. So the ones that are grayed out are for the application I'm in. And the bottom ones are the application I wanna to connect to. So the application I'm in right now is USAS. You can see that my um, title up here. So I'm gonna copy this. And then let me just make sure I generate the API key for this one too. And then um, what I'm gonna do is paste it in. And again, I know this is kind of hard to show right now because these actually are populated, but they would be blank. So I'm copying the key from USAS and then I'm gonna paste that into USPS. So I'm just kind of switching my tabs back and forth. Um, and then I'm gonna do the same thing. So now I'm in USPS and I'm gonna copy the um, ID and the key and I'm switching back to my USAS tab and I'm gonna put that in here. And then once I've basically taken USAS info, put it in USPS, USPS info, put it in USAS, I can save these up.
And then um, in both sides of the application, I have the option to test the connection. And so I would come in here and I would test this. And again, like this isn't something that you would normally have to do like when you first migrate over. Um, this is probably either if you're setting up like a test instance that you have to do something specific, um, you know, or if there ever is something that's like, you know, you're not sure um, of, but yeah, I don't know that I would just be doing this in like a standard instance all the time. Um, obviously, if something's not working right and you're not sure if you should do something with this, you can um, let us know and we're happy to help you with it. Um, but I can see that once my test uh, finishes, my connection is successful. And so now I've linked these two test instances together. And that's how I was able to push through those um, pending transactions um, in my demo land. Just make sure, just checking my notes, make sure we didn't miss anything there. Okay. All right, cool. So um, next we have the user-based balance checking. This adds balance checking options to our system user records. So this is basically allowing um, different warnings to pop up based on uh, the user that's actually trying to enter that transaction. Uh, so if I come in here, go to modules, and then, um, oops, I'm in USPS. See, I knew I knew I was gonna that was gonna get me at least at some point. Let's log out of USPS. <laughs> All right, back to you, Saz. All right, uh, so we're, here we'll go to system modules. And so I have user-based balance checking module. So that is enabled. Um, when I go to my system users setup, um, with that on, when I come in here and edit a user, what I'm gonna see is these three different checkboxes here. So I have the option to allow negative appropriation, allow negative budget, or warn on negative amounts. These, again, um, also something that connects to setup options in Classic. Uh, so if they had these um, different settings in USA Security, then this would come over from Classic. So this may already be automatically enabled, um, but if that's something that they wanna start using, they could certainly enable this and then set this up per user. Um, it does default to have all of these checked, but you know, then if they wanted to come in and you know say, okay, well, somebody doesn't have the ability to you know make this budget negative, they could uncheck this, and then um, instead they would get um, they wouldn't be able to proceed instead of just getting a warning, and then you know they just save that user setting. And within the rules, there are some rules in here um, as well that um, are specific to the user-based um, balance checking. So I can see that if you look at this like rule name, it actually says user-based balance checking in here. Um, and there are some different uh, warnings or like warning errors that you could enable or disable based on um, what you want um, that to check against. So like some of these we can see it includes future purchase order checking, um, purchase order requisition, um, as far as checking the balances here. This is where um, I need to clarify on Carrie's question because if we don't have pre-encumbrance module on, there are still some warnings that um, I believe you should be able to get on the requisition. So specifically these two, and actually maybe this is something that you can check, Carrie, is if these are enabled for that district, um, you know, is that these rules that don't have to do, sorry, my, uh, 
little zoom pop up is giving me trouble here. Okay, so I can see that some of these, you know, make reference to the pre encumbrance, and well, I guess all of these do exclude pre encumbrance. So it's possible some of these may be able to work, but th that's where my checking is going to have to do, and you know, and I'll follow up on that. But um, certainly on the user level, especially for purchase orders or like future future purchase orders, um, these different rules. Once you have this enabled, um, you can use these in combination with that user page um, to get those warnings set up here. And then for my last slide, I just had um, a note here that uh, some of these modules do require a restart of the application. So um, when we added that um, account receivable module, we saw that we could just refresh the page to be able to view that. Um, some of these are more complex, um, including that legacy password migration, um, some of these ones that connect to a different directory. Um, after installing the module, you actually have to do like a full app, a full restart of the application for those to take effect. So uh, this is no, notated in the wiki for um, the documentation for each of these. Um, I did recently in, you know, while setting up for this training, I did try and add some of the notes from, um, well, I did add, you know, some of the notes that we've covered today into that documentation for the modules as well. I know that's something we've been trying to add more to. So um, you can also refer there um, for some of this information, but it does say on there, you know, which one of these need the hard reset. So uh, keep that in mind if you are looking to use any of these. And we did pretty good on time today, but um, that is actually all I have. Um, for the modules and for those um, sections, but certainly if there are questions on um, anything we've covered today, we can definitely take time to uh, make sure we get anything answered that's outstanding. So questions, anyone? All right, well, um, I'll certainly hang out um, for another minute in case anyone is still typing them up. But um, for you know, those of you, if you don't have questions, thank you so much for attending today. Uh, I hope that this was helpful and um, we'll definitely get the recording posted out there. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day and a great weekend.